Shall we pray? Father, we acknowledge our dependence upon the Holy Spirit to teach us. Lord, our desire is not that our intellects would be gathering information, but that you would transform our understanding, reveal yourself to us, unveil your word to us, that, Lord, we would be quickened by the Holy Spirit as we hear the word. And uh, we pray, Lord, that the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you would be upon us today as we listen to the word. Lord, we, we look to you. We, we realize that to bring the word, we need your Holy Spirit. And to hear and understand and apply the word, we need your Holy Spirit. So, Holy Spirit, we, we trust you to help us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, as you can see from our outline today that we're, we're continuing on divine healing, one of the great truths about healing is that we are redeemed from the curse of the law. And um, I know for a number of years, I didn't know what the curse of the law was, so I didn't know what I was redeemed from. And uh, actually, they taught that Many of the things in the curse were actually God's method of teaching me, so I should embrace them. And, of course, once you see the truth about that, you reject that kind of teaching. But um, in our introduction there, it says, All Christians believe that Jesus was our substitute who bore our sins. And we have pointed out in the previous lessons that Jesus also bore our sicknesses. When we see our sins uh, taken by our substitute, we can believe in his offer of forgiveness. When we see that <clears throat> Christ has borne our, our curse of sickness, we can be healed. And so we want to look at some facts uh, regarding this. In Galatians 3, um, our, our text is Galatians 3.13, so maybe we ought to start there. <coughs> Excuse me. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Um, This is probably one of the clearest statements of our uh, right to inherit the blessings of the Old Testament as, as the spiritual seed of Abraham that you'll find anywhere in the Word. The blessings that belong to Abraham belong to Gentiles in Christ Jesus. It's not for Jews unless they're in Christ, you see. And uh, we, we Gentile believers need to understand that because many have been robbed of their covenantal blessings by the false teaching that that's for the Jews. Every promise of God is fulfilled in Christ. Jesus deserves every blessing of the old covenant, and you're his joint heir. You get it not because you deserve it. You get it because he deserves it, and you're his joint heir. But in uh, Galatians 3.10, it says, For as many as are of the works of the law... Are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in this book of the law to do them. So uh, the Abrahamic covenant was based on works, but then God added the Mosaic covenant to that. I mean, the, the Abrahamic covenant was based on faith. And then 430 years later, God added the Mosaic covenant, which was a covenant of works. And uh, the blessing promised through the Mosaic Covenant was the blessing of Abraham. But the law came to reveal what sin was so, so people would understand their need of a Savior. So the law had its place, but once you come to Christ, you don't need the law anymore to convince you that you were once a sinner. You need the gospel to convince you you're now a saint. And to help you understand what it means to walk in the Spirit, what it means to be a, a son of God, a daughter of God, obedient to the Lord in all things. But um, we see there in Galatians 3.10 that, that the curse of the law 
Uh, disobedience to the law brought a, cur- brought a curse. Now let's look in Deuteronomy chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 26. Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and the curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way which I command you today to go after other gods which you have not known. So, uh, here we see... uh, Uh, well, let's read 29 too. And it shall be uh, when the Lord your God has brought you into the land which you go to possess that you shall put the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. And later they did that. They went up on these mountains and pronounced the blessing on God's people if they obeyed and the curse on God's people if they disobeyed. Now we have to understand that the law was brutal. It, there was... Uh, uh, it was quite simply, it was black and white, blessing and cursing. Now, now God, God brought forth that revelation so we would understand the difference between justice and mercy. Uh, the, the basic law of humanity is what you sow, you reap. But the, but the truth of the gospel is you sowed, but Jesus reaped what you deserved. And he willingly took it so that you could be delivered from it. And, um, but here we see the black and white nature of the law. God will bless us if we obey. The curse comes. Now, this is Israel. God curses the people if they disobey. And then if we look in verse 27, or chapter 27, I mean, sorry. Twenty-seven, eleven. And Moses commanded the people on the same day, saying, These shall stand on Mount Gerizim and bless the people when you have crossed over the Jordan. And these shall stand on Mount Ebal and curse, uh, to curse. And and the Levites shall speak with a loud voice and say to, to all of Israel, Cursed is everyone, blah, 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 blah. And it goes on and on, listing the curse. And um, we can see how the Old Covenant was very serious about the blessing and the cursing. Then we come to chapter 28, and it really begins to outline the, uh, the, the blessing starts in 28.1. It should come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you on high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you. It's um, interesting to note that God's will is blessing. Man disobeys God and draws the curse, but God's will is the blessing. In fact, when he created man, he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And it says he blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth. So God's original uh, posture towards man was that man should be blessed with fruitfulness, with increase, that, that God's mark should be upon his people, and that's the covenantal mark of blessing and increase. And you see, today we have a lot of confusion in the church that we're not sure that, that we're supposed to be blessed. Well, God's intention is to bless us, but he, he is also aware that we can get uh, distracted by the things of this world and we do need the character development to to steward the blessing without getting sidetracked into the things of this world but you see the devil wants you to not think God wants you blessed so that he can't prosper you so that so that the gospel is hindered in going to the nations and so that uh, the the you know the, the church particularly in America has a vision to help the poor and the needy around the world. And, and, and many of the ministries today are helping the, the, the most poverty-stricken in Africa and other places. But if you ever see them on Christian television, they're constantly asking people to help because it takes a lot of money to do that. 
And while I disagree with some overemphasis on prosperity, I think we really need to have a healthy emphasis on prosperity, that God wants us to prosper, and that nobody says you have to spend it all on yourself. You could, you could believe God to prosper you and then give greater percentages of your income to the gospel, to the needy around the world, to uh, feeding the hungry and clothing the, 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 the naked and homeless and taking care of people around the world and the ministries uh, that really do a good job of that need to be funded. But anyway, it's important for us to understand blessing and cursing and um, disobedience to God's law. Look in Deuteronomy twenty-eight fifty-nine. Then the Lord shall bring upon your descendants extraordinary plagues, great and prolonged plagues, and serious and prolonged sicknesses. Um, sickness is part of the curse. In fact, um, if we read on here, he says, Moreover, he will bring back on you all the diseases of Egypt of which you were afraid, and they shall cling to you. Also, every sickness and every plague which is not written in the book of this law will the Lord bring upon you until you are destroyed. Now, note that Every sickness and every disease, even those not listed in this book, are part of the curse for the broken law. Now, we pointed out that um, God speaks as though he were causative in sending the sickness. But what, what we see is that the covenantal protection was lifted and sickness and disease which are in the world came upon the people. Um, uh, it's more, it, we see the same principle in ex, uh, Ezekiel, I think it's twenty two twenty, where he says, I looked for a man to stand in the gap, but since I couldn't find a man to stand in the gap and call upon me, uh, I heaped the fruit of their sinfulness on them. In other words, he let them reap what they had sown. And so it's, it's uh, Helps me, anyway, to understand that God isn't out smiting people with sickness and disease. Where would he get it? All right. So uh, Galatians 3.13 says, Christ became a curse for us. And uh, as it says in Galatians... I'm saying that sickness is not something that's in heaven that God could pull out of his sickness bank and give to the earth. It's something that's in the earth because of the fall and the curse. I don't believe all sickness is actively demonic, but the laws that have come into being through the fall have opened man up to vulnerability to sickness and disease. Okay. Um, in Galatians um, 3.13, he says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us as it is written... Cursed is everyone who hangs upon a tree. Now that's a quote of Deuteronomy 21, 23. And it's important for you to see what that actually says. Because Paul doesn't quote the whole thing. Uh, one uh, theologian has uh, uh, written a book about the fact that whenever, an, an, a, whenever a New Testament writer quotes an Old Testament scripture, he assumes that those he's writing to know the context, and it isn't necessary to quote the whole thing. But in uh, Deuteronomy uh, 21, 23, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day, so that we, uh, well, let's see. If a man, uh, verse 22, if a man committed a sin worthy of death and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. For he who is hanged is accursed of God. That's why the Pharisees could not believe Jesus was the Messiah because God would never allow his Messiah to be cursed by him in their thinking. 
But that is actually what happened to Jesus. He was accursed by God, and hanging on the tree was the evidence of that. But it wasn't for his sin. It wasn't for his rebellion. It wasn't for anything he did. It was for our sin, and the fullness of the curse came upon him. If you look in Deuteronomy 28, you'll find that... um, I wonder if I listed that there. Well, it's too long a passage, but... Uh, in, in part of that curse, it says that you will, you will be uh, hungry, thirsty, naked, and without all things. Now, when Jesus hung on the cross, he was hungry, he was thirsty, contrary to popular depictions, he was naked, and he was in want of all things. He exhausted the poverty curse on the cross. And uh, Corinthians says that, uh, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet he became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. And in the passage, it's not talking about spiritual riches, it's talking about finances. Now, as I say, we have to... We have to walk that out with the fear of the Lord and not with uh, allowing any kind of greed or ambition to to color that because uh, men are capable of uh, uh, proof texting what their flesh wants to do. And we don't want to do that, but we do we do want to possess uh, what God wants us to possess. It's always appropriate to believe what God's will in in the scriptures is for yourself. Um, So Christ became a curse for us. In Isaiah 53, (coughs) uh, 6, it says that uh, God caused to meet together on him the punishment of us all. And uh, the punishment for sin is different than the sin. The punishment is the consequences of sin, which would be uh, oppression, sickness, poverty, defeat, family breakdown. Actually, Deuteronomy 28 shows that the curse manifested in the family is the breakdown of the family. So you have the right to say your family is redeemed from the curse of family breakdown. Actually, it would do us all uh, good to spend some time pondering Deuteronomy 28 to find out what we're redeemed from. Because many believers today don't believe that they're redeemed from a lot of the things that the Word says we're redeemed from. All right, so he was cursed that we might be blessed. He has redeemed us, brought us out by paying a price. He paid the price for you to be redeemed. Redeem... Redeemed means to buy somebody out of bondage. Pay the price to get them out of bondage. In the slave market of the day, you could purchase the freedom of a slave. And all you had to do was meet meet the condition of the price that was asked. And Jesus paid the price to redeem us out of the authority of darkness. And um, he received that cursing that we might be blessed. Uh, I have listed there Exodus 2, 24. So God heard their groanings, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So, uh, God redeeming Israel out of bondage was him remembering the covenant oath that he had sworn to Abraham. Now, that indicates that you have a right covenantally to deliverance. Many may be the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. And let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed out of the hand of the enemy. Um, in Deuteronomy 29, find some more on this. 
verse uh, 10. All of you stand today before the Lord your God, your leaders and your tribes and your elders and your officers, all the men of Israel, your little ones and your wives, also the stranger who is in your camp, from the one who cuts the wood to the one who draws your water, that you may enter into covenant with the Lord your God into his oath, which the Lord your God makes with you today, that he may establish you today as a people for himself, and that he may be God to you, just as he has spoken to you, just as he has sworn to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to make this covenant and this oath, not with you alone, but also with him who stands here, uh, but also with him who stands here today before the Lord your God, as well as with him who is not even with us today. So we see here that the Mosaic covenant is built on the Abrahamic covenant. When you get over to Galatians, you'll find that the Mosaic covenant was added to the Abrahamic covenant as a temporary measure until the seed that was promised should come, who is Christ. And uh, it's a great uh, misunderstanding of the word of God to think that the natural Jew in the Mosaic covenant has a better standing with God or a unique standing with God that's better than the Gentiles. Actually, the... the uh, the word reveals that the covenant, the Mosaic covenant with natural Israel was a temporary covenant that awaited the coming of the Messiah. And it's something that's shocking to people today because I believe God is stirring people to love Israel and to pray for Israel and to see a harvest in Israel. But sometimes the theology surrounding that is misguided. Uh, because if you read in the book of Acts, Peter preaches and he says uh, that God has raised up Jesus... And he says that, and whoever receives him, he wants to bless with the forgiveness of sin, but whoever rejects him shall be cut off from the people. So the continuity of Israel is the church, and the Gentiles were added into the Jewish church. Anyway, I don't want to get off on that, but it's something to think about because many believers have a low view of the church because of this teaching that that God's just trying to get done with the church so he can move on to Israel. No, uh, God is trying to bring natural Israel into the church so that there can be one new man, Jew and Gentile, both in Christ. That's the destiny of the nations, is to be in Christ. All right, now, uh, by saying that, I'm not saying God isn't Jew dealing with the natural is Israelite, that there isn't some promises that may be fulfilled there but what we need to understand is they have no better status the highest status you can have in God is to be in Christ and that's available to you on an equal level that's why there's no Jew or Gentile in Christ once you're in Christ all those things are gone all right uh, the blessing is available in Christ Jesus we quoted uh, Galatians three thirteen, but in verse 14 it says uh, the blessings uh, might come on the Gentiles in Christ. You see, everything in Paul's revelation centers around being in Christ. You're either in Christ or you're in Adam. Verse 14, Christ, or verse uh, 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, as it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So Abraham's blessing uh, is yours because you're in Christ. And, and Abraham, one of the things that was promised to Abraham was the nations. And when Jesus rose from the dead, the Father said, Sit at my right hand while I make your enemies a footstool. Ask of me and I'll give you the nations for your inheritance. Well, you know what? He asked. And God gave him the nations, and now we're his foot soldiers to bring the nations to Christ. That's our assignment. Which is a much better assignment than hang on till the end. All right. So, so the blessing of Abraham. Abraham had all his needs met. Uh, his... Uh, he and his wife's barrenness was healed, and he became fruitful. In fact, 
uh, from a total inability to be fruitful to a supernatural ability to be the father of many nations was the fulfillment of that covenant promise. And uh, one of the other promises was he would possess the gates of his enemies. And uh, so we have a we have a promise of victory in spiritual warfare because we're the seed of Abraham. Um, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17, you don't need to turn to that. It says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. I heard the greatest little nugget the other day. How many know who Bob Jones is? Uh, Bob Jones is a prophet, uh, a seer prophet, a uh, man who has a lot of visions and revelations. And uh, Another younger prophet named Larry Randolph. Some of you know who Larry Randolph is. Uh, got a call from Bob, and Bob would is kind of a mysterious kind of a guy. Bob called him up and said, um, Larry, the Lord told me to rebuke you because you're practicing necromancy. And he said, Bob, I'm not practicing necromancy. That's trying to contact the dead. And he said, Larry, the Lord told me you're practicing necromancy. And he said, Bob, I've never done anything like that. I wouldn't do anything like that. I know better than that. He said, the Lord told me you're practicing necromancy. You keep talking to the old man as though he were there. (laughs) I like that. So the blessings of God are received by faith. You see, so many people say, well, how come so many Christians are sick? Well, they don't know they're redeemed from sickness. So they never stand up against the sickness. They never fight against it. They never seek to believe God to overcome it because they think it's all in God's sovereign hands. And so they become passive and accepting of whatever comes down the pike as though it were the will of God. Of course, there is that teaching that everything that touches your life uh, has come to you from God and is perfectly designed to help you grow. Um, Well, Life is perfectly designed to help you grow because there's enough evil in it, you'll have to cry out to God. But that's not a guarantee that he ordained it. In fact, it may have come. You see, if you've never heard, I have a series called War Over the Word. It's a teaching on the parable of the sower. It changed my life to get a hold of the truth in that parable. Now, what it says is, it's the teaching of Jesus concerning the sower sowing the word. Now, here's what Jesus said. The sower sows the word. Satan comes immediately to steal the word that's sown. Persecution and affliction arise because of the word. All right? Now, uh, if you just put those two thoughts together, you understand that the war is over the word and its possible effects in your life. And it isn't God that's sending persecution and affliction. It's the devil to try to get the word out of the good ground of your heart before it can bring forth fruit because the incorruptible seed brings forth after its own kind. So the war is over your faith. The devil doesn't care about you personally. You're no threat to him. But when you learn to appropriate the promises of God, when you learn to take God at his word, stand on that word and see the results in this life, you become dangerous to the kingdom of darkness. And so uh, all hell seeks to get you out of the race, to discourage you. Well, I tried to stand on the promise, but it got worse. Well, that's often what happens because Satan comes immediately to steal the word that's sown. Uh, You get prayer, your symptoms are lessened, but the next day they're worse. And you say, I thought I was healed, I guess I wasn't. And you open the door again, instead of saying, I got prayer last night, and the anointing came, and I started to get better. I'm not accepting this. Satan, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. You'd be amazed how many testimonies we have of people who got prayer, all the pain left, the next day pain came again. And they said, no, in Jesus' name. And the pain left immediately. Uh, I just heard a testimony of someone who uh, received their, their healing and, uh, for, for a deaf ear. And the next day it came back. They rebuked it. It left. And this went on for about three months until finally 
they they'd shown their steadfastness and the healing was totally consistently manifested. But there is a war over these things and the devil wants to take advantage of us while we're ignorant. You see, uh, we, we have kind of a, uh, what's that uh, they say about your, uh, your default uh, on your computer, your default settings? Well, our default setting is why did God allow this? We fall right back into that. We forget that he maybe didn't allow it. Maybe it has nothing to do with his will. But we've been, so, we've been so inundated with the sovereignty of God teaching that we're always wondering why God allowed that. And that's our default position. But we have to change the default position to know uh, God is good. The devil is bad. God gives blessings. The devil gives cursings. This is a curse. I resist it in Jesus' name. Now somebody says, well, what if, what if God allowed it for a purpose or what if God, uh, it, God's hand is in it? Well, if God's hand is in it, you can rebuke it all day and it won't go. But my default position is rebuke it. If it doesn't go, I'll ask God if there's other factors. You see, because sometimes you say, you know, Lord, I rebuked it. It didn't go. And he says, yeah, and um, uh, what about that person that you uh, are angry with? Oh, I think I need to make an adjustment here. And sometimes there are things that need to be dealt with in order to operate in faith. And so we allow for that. But, but, but we have to get black and white. We have to get childlike in our simplicity. Uh, you know, I remember um, I had some fellowship with some uh, a dear couple, Catholic charismatics. They were just filled with the Spirit, lovely people. And um, I was with them. Uh, one day and uh, the the wife said to me Joe we heard the other day that uh, God was uh, sending sickness and problems to us is that right just very teachable and I said well I personally don't believe that's right I believe God is the author of good things not of evil things and she said yeah that's my Jesus (laughs) and you see if you think about it Jesus went around about his whole earthly ministry and everybody that came to him was blessed and healed. He never said, well, you know, you deserve this. Now, some people didn't know they were forgiven, so he had to forgive them so they could get healed. Some people had a stronghold of guilt and they hadn't appropriated what the Day of Atonement had provided for them. So he had to tell them they were forgiven and then tell them to rise up and walk. All right. So the blessing is available in Christ and it's received by faith. How do I receive it? Well, you study to show yourself approved. Someone who knows the word of God and can discern the will of God from the word of God. Now, something that sometimes happens is God speaks to us. By the Holy Spirit. He, he'll say something to us. But there is a teaching that says, unless God speaks to you, you can't claim the promises. Well, I would challenge that. These promises are sealed in the blood of the Son of God. And God is serious about what he promises. And uh, now, sometimes we can be new to the promises or new to claiming things by faith and need some time to get established in the truth to renew our minds to the Word of God so that we're really confident. You see, sometimes people hear, hear a message and then they want to try it out. Well, it's not the trier of the Word that's blessed. It's the doer of the Word. So you have to take the time to establish your heart before God in the truth of His promise so that when you do make your stand on it, when you do pray the prayer of faith and ask God to give you the answer by faith, that you're, you're able to endure the, the counterattack of the enemy and hold fast until you see the answer. But if you're just trying it, you see, when the enemy comes in uh, with his uh, attack, you'll cave in and give up your faith. So sometimes you need to take some time to study these things out. And of course, we, one of the reasons we have a bookstore and a tape library is so that you can saturate yourself in any subject 
that you have need to study to see what the Word says. And we very carefully select the books in our bookstore. Um, and uh, I've got over 20 years of teaching in the tape library, plus many other uh, great Bible teachers. Tapes are available as well. But the thing is, uh, we have to realize that it takes time to separate yourself from tradition. And most of us don't know tradition is in our life till we hear something different. And usually when you hear something different, it shocks you. And you say, well, that can't be right, because it's different than what you've heard. But the way you determine is you see if it's chapter and verse, and it's quoted in its context. Anybody can pull a verse out of context and build a doctrine. But if you look at the context and find that it is actually saying in its context, without any twisting of that word, what the teacher says it's teaching, then you can trust it. Because the word doesn't need to be manipulated to make it say what it says. It's very simple and childlike. Uh, Childlike approach is the best. God says what he means and he means what he says. But faith is the way we receive the blessings and faith begins, as we've been emphasizing, with the knowledge of God's will. So we have to take the time to, that's one of the reasons we're doing this uh, series of messages and probably um, next week we'll start talking about some of the common objections to divine healing that that people raise. And uh, because you have to sort through those things. Uh, I remember that I had been taught very much about Paul's thorn being sickness and uh, that was a stumbling block to my faith. And I heard somebody preach uh, what I now believe to be the truth about it and it was like a flash of light in my spirit and I all of a sudden saw it completely differently but immediately my mind went back to the default position and I had to go pray and wait on God to get that revelation to actually affect my mind. Revelation will come to your spirit first and then it'll flash into your mind and sometimes as you're sitting under the word you, you like, it's like you have a flash of insight and then if you had to articulate it you couldn't really say what it was. You just, you just caught it because there's... there's a, the anointing will open up your spirit and make a deposit. And sometimes while it does that, there's a flash of light into your mind, but your mind isn't the first place to get the revelation. And so then you have to go back and go over the word to get your mind to catch up with your spirit because your spirit's always ahead of your mind. Uh, The spirit of man already knows the things of God. That's why we're transformed by the renewing of our minds because our mind is the slow partner here. And the mind has ruled the roost for so long, it doesn't want to submit to the truth of God's word. It wants to say, let me understand this, then I'll believe it. And God's premise is, no, you believe it, and I'll give you the understanding. You see, uh, our human intellects are like proud children that don't want to obey. And we have to subdue the mind. We have to present it. And we have to say, uh, you know, the the fleshly mind is enmity against God. The mind set on the flesh, the mind that says, um, unless you give me evidence, I will not believe. That's the mind of the flesh. The mind of the spirit says, I'm created to believe the word of God. I will believe the word of God. So we receive these blessings by faith. And... um, Mark eleven twenty four says, Whatever things you ask when you pray, believe you receive them and you will have them. What people often fail to note is that you are to do your believing when you pray. You see, the prayer of faith is to believe you have something because God gives it to you in its spiritual form. That the answer, because think about this now, God, who is a spirit, created all matter. And God is endeavoring to get us to walk with him, who is spirit. So doesn't it make sense that he would want to get us to operate in the sphere he's in so we could receive from him? So he wants to teach us how to receive something in its spirit form, trusting him to manifest it in its 
physical form. But he wants you and I to believe that when we pray according to his will, he hears us, and if we know he hears us, we know we have the request that we've made of him. Well, how do I know it? By the assurance of faith. How do I know it? Because God's not a man that he should lie. See, well, should I have a warm, fuzzy feeling? Well, sometimes people do, but you can't go by your feelings because that feeling might leave tomorrow. And does that mean God stopped hearing your prayer when the feeling leaves? No, you have to go by the naked word of God. It's great when feelings come. It's great when there's an instant manifestation. But what are you going to do when there's not? Are you going to believe God? Is God less truthful when you don't feel it? No, he is consistently truthful at all times. And so we set our hearts to believe God. You know, I don't know if you ever thought about this, but we're called believers. <laughs> not doubters, not unbelievers, but believers. Because God, God names us what we are. You're created to live in faith. You're created for faith. And, um, and I believe God is going to bring a word to his church that's going to bring them into a whole new level of faith. Because uh, in the history of the church... The great moves of God have, have been brought forth by people who had a very high view of the scriptures. And they believed they could, they could stand upon the promises of God. And uh, the 19th century faith movement, which I talk about in my book on Kenyon, uh, was a powerful move of God. And they actually, uh, it was pre the Pentecostal movement, And they just had a miraculous flow of healings based on the prayer of faith. They would instruct people to to believe that when prayer was offered, healing took place regardless of what they felt. And I'm not suggesting that you should do this or that this is wisdom for this hour. But they would stop taking their medicine and trust God. And uh, the flow of healings that came was utterly amazing. Uh, there was such a tremendous amount of divine healing. Um, But it was just based on standing on God's promises. And in most cases, it was not an instantaneous healing. It was a gradual healing. Uh, uh, They were a little better after prayer, uh, but they continued to thank God and praise God. And so the next day they were better. And uh, over a couple of week period, some of them uh, got full use of their muscles and, and, and joints and everything back. Sometimes it took a couple of months. But you see, they're standing on the word of God. They're believing that God wants them well and that the promises are good. And uh, they're fighting the good fight of faith, believing that, um, that, that God heard them when they prayed and that healing is working in their body. Now, regarding medications... Uh, I don't see where medication necessarily hinders anybody's faith. In fact, medication can hold down the symptoms so that you're not distracted by the pain or whatever, so that you can focus on the Lord and continue in prayer. Now, God does lead some people to lay aside their medicine, and I'm fine with that if that's what God says. But when people start doing that, trying to, trying to make God do something, they can get hurt. Uh, uh, how many have ever seen Joel Osteen on TBN? Uh, Joel's uh, father, John Osteen, was the original pastor of that church. And um, I used to get his monthly magazine when we first started the church. He had a story in his, church, in his magazine about two men in his church, both diabetics. And one of them had just began to confess the word every day, by his stripes I am healed. I am healed of diabetes. I no longer have diabetes I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. Well, he kept taking his insulin, kept measuring the need of insulin, and over a period of months, his need of insulin finally got so low that he went to the doctor, and the doctor said, you don't need this anymore, you're you're completely free. Well, that was a wonderful testimony. But there was another man in his church who heard the teaching and threw away his insulin. Well, he went into an insulin coma and uh, almost died. And you see, he was acting in presumption, not in faith. And uh, so... Uh, we don't want to bring a bad name on the teaching by uh, acting in presumption. 
But you see, God is wanting to heal people. And sometimes he does lead people to, well, I've had people in the church say, the Lord told me to lay aside my medicine. And they have, and the healing came forth and proving that it really was God that spoke that. But you can't just do that as a principle, I don't think. Some people may say you can, but I don't think that's wisdom. And too many people are susceptible to imitating others. And uh, we don't want uh, to do more funerals. We want to see more healings. Amen. Amen. 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says, This is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. You see? So that's why you need to take the time to get a hold of his will. Because once you're convinced it's his will, you have the assurance that God will hear you when you ask. Then he says, If we know that he hears us whatever we ask... We know we have the requests we've asked of him. See, how do you know? You know by faith. You know by the integrity of God. You know by the faithfulness of God. You see, you're not basing it on a feeling. You're basing it on the integrity of God and what he said in his word he would do. He said, if you ask according to his will, he'll hear you. And if you know he hears you, you have it. It's yours. The Amplified Bible says we know with a settled and absolute knowledge that the requests we made of him are ours. With a settled and absolute knowledge. There's an inner knowing that we have a thing by faith. Is it possible for people to uh, misjudge that? Yeah. Yeah, it's like riding a bike. Sometimes you think you're riding and you crash. But you get back up and you get back on the bike until you get it down because there hasn't been at least in in our age there hasn't been that much sound teaching on faith well in some streams there are but in the mainstream of the body of Christ there hasn't been very much strong teaching on faith folks you need faith you need to be strong in faith without faith it's impossible to please God I have tapes on faith that I've had for 20 years, I continue to listen to them because I need to continue to grow in my understanding and application of faith because uh, medically, my condition, there's no natural hope. I need a miracle. And uh, so to believe for a miracle, I need God to direct my steps and help me understand and move into the place of receiving. And so... uh, I I keep building myself up. I keep getting teaching. I keep going back over. You see, with with the deeper things of the Spirit, you don't need some new revelation. You need to really get the old one. You see, uh, over time, things that were once life to you can become just what you mentally assent to. And you can say, well, you know, I remember a guy uh, who used to come to the church who... At one time, he had uh, gotten uh, sick, stood on the word, uh, and at that time he was going to a lot of full gospel businessmen's meetings, praying for the sick, moving in the spirit, doing a lot of different things. And he was really at a kind of a high peak of his spiritual life, and he stood on the word and was was completely healed of his situation. Well, he uh, twisted his ankle... And um, he knew that you should act on the word, so he was walking around stomping his foot on the floor. Well, the next time I saw him, he was in a cast. Because, you see, what you can do at one level of spiritual apprehension can be lost over time if you don't keep refreshing it. And you still agree with it doctrinally, but you don't have the substance, the reality, the anointing operative in your life. And so you have to continue to feed that, strengthen that, encourage that, so that you, you, keep your, you keep your knife sharp, you keep your edge sharp, and uh, uh, building yourself up. Yeah. 